back for the very last of the, the seven lectures. It's obviously a very great honour to introduce Professor uh, Tony Ryan, who um, is of Sheffield Science. Um, if you listen to Radio 4, you'd have heard him exchanging banter with uh, Ryan Cox on various programmes. Uh, and he's obviously sort of a leading uh, scientist sort of working on uh, Project Sunshine, but he's also an incredibly uh, innovative one. Um, he's done things like work with fashion designers to make dissolving dresses or clothes that um, purify uh, the air. So it's a very great pleasure uh, to hand you over to Tony Ryan. Well, thank you very much, Cathy. And um, uh, hold on. Um, I've, I've, had a, I've had a rough week. Um, I'm kind of feeling tired. We've got Science Week going on at the moment, uh, and there's a big science festival in the university. So I went to work at 8 o'clock on Monday morning and got home at 9 o'clock on Monday night, having spent from half past four till uh, half past eight making ice cream uh, with my 10 year old daughter for loads of screaming kids are using liquid nitrogen. And then last night I did the most stressful thing I've ever done, uh, which was kind of acted as. Jonathan Ross uh, and did a kind of on the couch interview with Jim Alkalele who does TV documentaries and, and does the life scientific and I was just telling Kathy it's really nice because I just rang him up and said okay Jim you owe me uh, you, you've got to come to our science week and, and at that event um, I gave him a copy of this book uh, to say thank you uh, because there was a uh, we got a bookseller in, and the bookseller had a bookstall with all Jim's books on, <laughs> and this one, uh, because this book came out on the 13th of March, and, um, and you've all had the PDF file, I understand, of this book. No? I think so. No, 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 no. So, so, so whatever, as, long, as long as you don't tell the publishers that I've given away 80 copies of, of the book uh, as a PDF, then yeah, you can, you can, you're welcome. I, I sent it in to whomever. So, so the book's called Project Sunshine, How Science Can Use the Sun uh, to Fuel and Feed the World. And, um, and that's me. And this guy, Steve McKevitt, uh, is a University of Sheffield politics graduate. And he left the politics department with a 2-2 and um, was in a band uh, for a while. And then he went to work in the gaming industry uh, and he was kind of PR director for uh, a company that eventually was taken over by Nintendo. And then he's, he's ran a couple of PR companies, communications companies. And um, when we set up Project Sunshine to kind of bring together the research from across science, engineering and social science, uh, we wanted to, to have a strong brand to tell the, to tell the story um, and, and a two minute movie. And so Steve came to write the script for the two minute movie and the book is an outcome of that meeting. So, so I talked to Steve for an hour, he turned an hour into uh, a minute and 45 seconds of really tight script because that's what he does he's a copywriter essentially an advertising copywriter and um, and then we made this really high production value movie and at the end of the conversation I said you know the, the, this this story would be a great book uh, I've done all the research but I just don't have time to write the book and he said well well I do and so that's what we did so we wrote this is this is a collaboration between a chemist and the politics graduate. And this is the problem we're facing. So, for some reason, the United Nations decided that Danica May Camacho was the seven billionth citizen. And she was born on the 30th of October, 2011, in the Philippines. Citizen 7 billion. When was citizen 1 billion born? Late 1800s. Right? In 120 years, there's been a sevenfold increase in the Earth's population. I've lived through the Earth's population more than doubling. Before the start of the 20th century, nobody. Had lived through the Earth's population doubling. 
unless you believe in Adam and Eve. Okay? Nobody had lived through the Earth's population doubling. And then we've had 120 years of some people seeing the Earth's population increase by a factor of six in their lifetime. My grandfather was one of those. But my children, who are half your age, won't see the Earth's population double. They may even see in their lifetime the Earth's population fall. They'll certainly see it stabilise as will you. And the question is, what number will it stabilise at? So here's a graph. This is figure one from the book of uh, the world population growth since 1750 and the population in billions. And this is the population in the developed world and it's already falling. So the population in Europe that the, the, the indigenous population is falling and it's, there's net immigration that's causing the population to be almost stable. In the UK, our population's grown by um, less than 20% in the last century, whilst the Earth's population's increased by a factor of six. So there's hardly any growth down here, and there's massive growth in the developing world. This isn't a problem in and of itself. I'm not making any moral judgments about the population and its growth. It's just, this is just the fact of demographics. Life's got better. People are living longer. If you live longer, you have more kids. Once, um, and when, the, when there's a mismatch between the birth rate and the death rate, the population grows. And you end up with the bulge of people of breeding age. That's you. Right? And those people, especially if they've grown up in a culture where having many children is the norm, continue to have many children, even though there's no genetic necessity to pass on that many more copies of your genes. It's cultural. So, Steve and I got together because we went to hear this fella, Al Gore, uh, talk about uh, the inconvenient truth uh, before it was a movie, and that happened in the Octagon Theatre. It was a great, great day. Um, Steve wrote this book, uh, Everything Now, which is essentially um, explains why we live in such a consumerist society. And then Project Sunshine, uh, the science behind food and energy sustainability, and all this imagery was generated by Steve's firm. And uh, I even rode up here on my bicycle in my Project Sunshine Hydra's jacket. So the, my fundamental message to you is we're going to be fine. Right? We don't need to save the planet. The planet's going to be A-OK. -okay. We need to save the people. We need to save the people from themselves. From their profligacy. From their wasteful consumerism. And we need to learn how to use the sun. Because there's a fantastic fusion reactor that's 93 million miles away. And energy arrives here on the Earth 8 minutes and 19 seconds after it's left the sun. And there's enough of it, we're a tiny pinprick, so we, we intercept hardly any of the sun's energy, but there's enough energy on the sun to deliver us 100,000 terawatts. That's 100,000 joules per second of collectible energy arrives on the Earth. And this, this is a thousand times more than we need to run the economy. And if we can collect one hour of sunlight, we can drive the Earth's economy for a whole year. <coughs> so the way the book works is, is it, it sets up the, um, the problem. There's, there's a bit of jeopardy. And you're all there thinking, we're doomed, we're all doomed, right? Um, 
And then we go on and we explain how, how we've got to where we've got to, because there's some really interesting stuff. Um, so so here's, here's a timeline from the formation of the Earth uh, through to the present day. And, um, and basically, when, when, when I made the book proposal, it was, well, well we're going we're gonna to start with the condensation of a gas cloud uh, to form a star, and then, and then the accretion disk around the star makes a rocky planet, and then life evolves on this rocky planet. So, so that kind of gets us to here. And, and then this planet, it, it's in the Goldilocks zone, right? So it's, it's far enough away from the sun that there's liquid water on the surface. It also has a liquid core, a liquid metal core. That's very important because that means that the, the planet continues to rotate. It doesn't sit still. Okay? If you go to other planets, where as they go around the sun, they're not rotating on their axis, because one side of the planet faces the sun all the time, there's a hot side and a cold side. And what happens is on the hot side, any water there boils off and disappears out into the universe. So Brian Cox could gaze at it. <laughs> and on the cold side, you get ice. And you need water for life. So there's no life on the hot side because it's dry. And there's no life on the cold side because it's ice. And any water that does evaporate from the cold side meanders over to the hot side and boils off. So you have to have a spinning planet. And you get ice at the poles. Or if it's warm enough, you have no ice at the poles and a higher sea level. And the spinning makes a magnetic field. And the magnetic field protects you from all the nuclear radiation waste coming off of this fusion reactor in the middle. So, so the, 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 there are lots of conditions needed to make a habitable planet. So, anyway, so, so you get this habitable planet, it's got rocks, it's got water, um, and there's kind of interesting chemistry going on in the water. There's stuff happening, there are molecules interacting, um, there are crusty pools, stuff's happening at the crust as, as things dry out and re-precipitate. Um, and then eventually, in this crust, um, you get molecules that can make copies of themselves, and then, and then there are more molecules um, that encapsulate those molecules in a bag, and you make a membrane, uh, and you get cells. And all those cells, and it, and it may well be, there's a guy called Nick Lane who's touting this theory around that the first life wasn't actually near the surface of the sea, it was at the bottom of the sea in, what, in near what are called hot smokers. So you have a, a thermal vent under the sea, and the membrane that has iron pumps is, is literally little pockets in the rock that have a different chemical constitution outside and inside the pocket. And that gradient in concentration is essentially uh, an energy store. And, and that energy store then allows you to do, to do life things. Because to be alive, you need to, you need to keep yourself away from equilibrium. Because equilibrium is dead. So, these living cells are scavenging chemical energy from their environment. And then some of them work out how to do photosynthesis, how to use the energy from the sun to make their own food. And when they do that, they make their own food by taking gases from the atmosphere right, and splitting water and then using that. So your water's H2O, right? you split the water, you get oxygen. Oxygen's the waste product. What these bugs want is the hydrogen, because the hydrogen does the chemistry to make their food, to make their carbohydrate. And basically, they piss oxygen. <laughs> right? And that changes our atmosphere. Because this oxygen has to go somewhere. And what happens is, the oxygen level in the atmosphere starts to rise after a couple of million years, because the that oxygen goes into the sea, into the water, and it oxidizes iron. From iron 2, Fe2+, to iron 3, Fe3+, 
iron 3 is not soluble in water and so it precipitates what does it make at the bottom of the sea? iron ore the iron ore that drove the industrial revolution was made by bugs two and a half billion years previously photosynthesis made iron ore and then we dug it up and started making stuff out of it that's beautiful right? so when they'd used all the iron up that oxygen started to accumulate in the atmosphere then you get a whole different set of bugs arrive that use the oxygen because that's what evolution does it takes advantage of of an ecosystem this new ecosystem has <coughs> oxygen and so then you get you get fancy cells uh, cells with with nuclei a eukaryotic cells these cells clump together there's actually a bit of lumpiness in the oxygen up here there's a couple of mass extinctions and and the, the Cambrian explosion and dinosaurs and all of those things um, and then eventually these vertebrates beget like in the if, if and if this whole story was in a day then the last two seconds have people us And until 350 years ago, which is kind of the last tick on the clock in this day, we lived like every other animal. We lived at the limit of food supply. And that food supply came from the sun. At one point, 150,000 years ago, there were 40,000 breeding pairs of human beings. 40,000. So there might have been a hundred thousand people. They'd have all fit in a football stadium. All the people on the earth. And given our physiology and, and our range, there should be at most a couple of million of us. There just shouldn't be this many people. But for the fact that we're sentient. We've taken control of our environment. Um, there's a, the, I, m I met an, an animal and plant scientist student yesterday. She here. Hello. Now, one, one of my best friends is Sir David Reed. He's a, he's a botanist. And, uh, and he says this frequently, that um, the plants made our planet the beautiful thing it is. And the animals have been trying to screw it up ever since. And, and we are the top animal and we've done the best job of screwing it up. Because what you have to remember is, what colonised the land first were plants doing photosynthesis. So photosynthesis developed in the oceans, then animals developed to take advantage of that food. Because right? everything we eat is ultimately sunshine. Even, if, even carnivores eat things that have eaten plants so all food comes back to plants and so when, when the land was colonised because there was oxygen available for energy it was the plants that went onto the land and the animals followed those and here the first multicellular plants and animals half a billion years ago when they laid down and died they made coal so the two things from the Industrial Revolution, iron ore and coal and clever people, all result from photosynthesis. So, all of, all of the societies prior to 350 years ago ran an energy current account. The energy arrived in year and was used in year. There was very little energy passed over from one year to the next. Bit of building material, some firewood, maybe maybe if you were very lucky, you might have a whole year of drain store. But but it all was it all came down from the sun, was turned into food and building materials, and used in year. And all of them, Stone Age, Bronze Age, Iron Age, hunter gatherers, agrarian societies, um, all the energy to drive those economies came from the sun and was used, if not in year, at least in a lifetime. Now, 
you get to a situation where these clever people have used the sun, have developed farming, right? And don't think that farming is some idyll, right? Farming shit, right? The best life, hunter gatherer. You've got a big range, you know where everything is, you're not digging holes, you're just kind of wandering around eating stuff, <laughs> lying down, having a kip, no one's hassling you. Right. Farming, you have to dig the land, you have to chase the weeds, dig the weeds away, get rid of the birds that are going to eat your food. It's not good. Why did we start farming? We started farming because there were too many people to live as hunter-gatherers. And once you start farming, right? I mean, you can become clever. Hunter-gathering got us to be clever because learn, we learn how to cook food. When you cook food, you have to expend less energy digesting it. So you need to spend less time ruminating. You can spend more time thinking or plotting. <laughs> How do we get more than them? Right? And then you get into this farming situation. Where we're not going to share our territory. We're going to enclose this land. And we're going to farm it and keep everything else off. And that's what happened. But all of these, then we got up to about 600 million people, and they lived the majority of them lived a subsistence living at the limit of food supply. The population ebbed and flowed. Europe, kind of 350 years ago, was hit in the Industrial Revolution. Southeast Asia was then and is now the most heavily populated and fertile place on the earth. Because they had absolutely industrialised organic farming. Nothing was wasted. And the combination of farming was, was ducks on the top of ponds, fish in ponds, rice in adjacent ponds, and pigs and chickens on the land. And the population there was, was almost as high uh, 300 years ago uh, as it is today around the, uh, in the cities in Shanghai and the like. No coal, no oil, no gas. And then... Uh, there was an Elizabethan energy crisis. Uh, it was peak wood. You've heard of peak oil, right? Well, there was peak wood. All of a sudden, the UK started to be deforested because there was enormous pressure on the land to provide fuel, building materials, and wood for ships to wage war and trade. So fuel's running out, the population's growing, uh, and food was in short supply. And the solution to this problem was to disconnect from the solar cycle to use buried sunshine. And that buried sunshine was in the form of coal. So coal is just a concentrated energy store. Um, and all fossil fuels are buried sunshine one form or another. And it allowed us to break the link. Now you had a really dense energy supply that's essentially free, you dig it out of the land, and all we had to do was learn to use it. Why did the Industrial Revolution happen around here? Why did it happen in the, I mean in the north of England in particular, uh, but in the UK? And the answer is labour price. Labour was more expensive in the UK than anywhere else in Europe. All the other places in Europe had the same technology, the same natural resources that are deposits of iron ore and coal all over. But it was industrialised here because the labour price was high. It was worth making the investment in the, in the R&D, in the research and the development of how to use this free energy. So then, um, then you, you, so this is, a, this is just a, a, an etching from the period. Um, actually, it's quite a good technical drawing, because there's a scale bar, which is this dog, so you can see it's a metre. Uh, and it's, it's human beings going around in a wheel, uh, driving a pump um, that takes the water that's flooding a mine. Right? So the steam engine hadn't been invented, but coal was being mined already, and human beings were powering the pumps. And you have to pay for the labour of these people, so if you can make a machine to drive the pump, you don't have to pay the people. And it was these kinds of interactions that drove the Industrial Revolution. 
So, so now we have we we moved we diffused from being being a coal powered economy to being an oil powered economy over a period of about fifty years, uh, and now this oil powered economy um, has has a fertilised agronomy. I'm going to explain what those things mean. So up to 1750, the the population growth was slow. Right? So it take a, it take a thousand years for the population to double. Um, but this, the, the Industrial Revolution caused this growth in population in the developing world. Between um, 1800 and 1900, the UK's population increased by approximately a factor of four. <coughs> right? How did we deal with it in the UK? It was easy. We farmed four times as much land. Where was that land? in the colonies and the empire. It wasn't here. And then, between 1900 and 2000, the Earth's population increased by a factor of four. Could they put four times more land under the plough? Were there four more planets of resource to go collect? No. So in this period, between 1900 and 2000, the Earth's population grew, doubling every 150 years in 1900, and doubling every 25 years in 2000, we had to do something else. In the 1900s, scientists were concerned about food security, having enough food to eat in the UK. Prior to 1900, no turd went wasted. Every piece of shit was picked up. Kids were employed to chase horses to collect manure. Every piece of human excrement was collected to be spread on the land. Because back here, in the Enlightenment, we worked out that plants needed phosphorus, nitrogen, and potassium to grow. Now, the, the potassium and the phosphorus are easy to get because they're in bones. So you can burn bones. So one form of fertiliser was bone meal. But the nitrogen's really, really hard to get. Because the nitrogen's in DNA and protein, right? not in bones. And, um, we use shit. We used fossilised shit. From South Africa, right? There were fortunes made, in, there were in billionaires in today's terms by transporting fossilised penguin poo <laughs> from South America to Europe. Right. I, know, I know you think I'm obsessed by this and the reason is in 1900 we broke free of poo because Harbour and Bosch invented a process to take nitrogen from the air and nitrogen can only be fixed by bacteria that grow in nodules on the roots of plants known as legumes, the peas and beans. Yeah. Right? But if you can fix nitrogen directly, you can make fertilizer. And, and Haber and Bosch learned how to do that. Uh, the tragedy is that, that Fritz Haber invented the technology that allowed us to feed the world and to be food secure, but he also invented chemical warfare, a really, really uh, conflicted character. And then, so, so first we have um, the Hammer Bosch process that gives us nitrogen. And, it, and the, the population doesn't really grow. It's only after the Second World War that we start to see this explosion in growth. And this was because of a fellow called Norman Borlaug. And what Borlaug did was he started the Green Revolution. And the Green Revolution depends on two genes a rice gene and a wheat gene. And those genes are the genes that make dwarf plants. Now why do you need to make a dwarf plant? So plants, when plants are growing, right, you've heard of tall poppy syndrome. Yeah, the, the poppy that kind of reaches for the sun. And that, that survives and thrives because it gets more sunlight than the rest of the poppies. Okay? If you have a dwarf plant, it's hidden from the sun by all the plants around it. So plants invest a lot of energy in making tall stalks so that they can see the sun.
But if you can convince the plants, if you can breed the plants to have short stalks, then they'll have more energy to put into seed, and you get a higher yield from the plant. When you harvest the plants, rather than having 30% of the mass as being edible food, now you've got 60 or 70% of the mass as edible food. And you have to be natural selection, because natural selection wouldn't let a dwarf gene propagate. And that's, that's how we intervene through plant breeding in the genetics of plants. And then plants were optimised to have short stalks, lots of seeds, and be artificially fertilised by farmers. And cheap oil, well, cheap oil drives all of our economy. Uh, transport infrastructure is predicated on cheap oil, and we build with oil. So, so this is a, this is a cement factory out near Hadassage. Uh, in every ten tons of cement. Uh, you've had to burn one and a quarter tons of oil to make it. Uh, in every ten tons of steel, you've had to burn eight and a half tons of oil to make it. In every ten tons of aluminium, you've had to burn thirty-eight tons of oil to make it. So, you want to be good to the environment. You go buy a new lightweight car with low fuel consumption. Okay, but there's been thirty-eight tons of oil burned to make every 10 tons of aluminium car and there's only been eight and a half tons of oil burned to make 10 tons of steel car. How more efficient does that car have to be to get you ahead in energy terms? We're not going to do that calculation. <laughs> <laughs> right? But th th that, I just give you that example for how complicated this issue is. There are no easy answers. But most importantly, we eat oil. So a ton of wheat contains 20 grams of uh, nitrogen in, in fertilizer, uh, and 10 tons of fertilizer contains uh, seven tons of oil. We eat oil. 3% of the Earth's energy budget is spent on the Harbour Bosch process. If there was no Harbour Bosch, right, so that's here, we could, we could feed maybe two and a half billion people, maybe three billion people, if we sent people out of the cities to farm the land organically. If we were organic, we could have two and a half billion people. Who's going to decide, Prince Charles, which five billion people die so that we can all get Dutchy organic food? Right? My kids are completely indoctrinated to go to a Catholic school. Uh, the priest came in one day, he's, he's offering my daughter some milk. And to encourage her to drink it, he said it's organic. My daughter, lover, said, um, we don't have organic milk in our house, Father. To the priest, I mean. Um, uh, because it's unchristian. <laughs> um, he says, For forgive me, child. How can, how can organic milk be unchristian? And she said, well, um, if we had organic milk, we'd only be able, if we all drank organic milk, we'd actually only be able to feed a billion people. And so six billion people would have to die. Um, yeah, fantastic, isn't it? <laughs> Ten year old. Oh, God, I love her. <laughs> okay, I've indoctrinated her. <laughs> right? uh, I, just as the Catholic Church indoctrinated me, and I don't want to indoctrinate you, right? But I want you to start to think about the choices you make as people and the choices we make as a society. So, oil. It's in everything we do. And just in case you didn't believe me, population in billions is the dark line. Oil consumption is the dotted line. Fertilizer consumption is the dashed line. They march in step. We eat buried sunshine. And we cannot do it forever. Because the buried sunshine is going to run out. Added to that, when you unbury the sunshine, um, you cause problems with the carbon dioxide level in the atmosphere. Um, you can, and I'm really not bothered whether you believe in climate change or not, whether you, whether you think this hockey stick uh, plot is a load of bullshit because uh, actually um, it really doesn't matter 
because uh, if we don't solve this problem, we're already screwed. Right? We have to solve the feeding 7 billion problem, and in doing so, take carbon out of the atmosphere, to take carbon out of the supply chain, and because there isn't enough oil to burn to feed them. So, so if we manage to get through that, we'll solve this problem anyway. So, Sir John Bennington was the UK Government Chief Science Officer, and in 2009, he wrote this paper called A Perfect Storm. Too many people, not enough energy or food, unsustainable economic growth, climate change. He estimated that we need 17 terawatts of energy. Compare that to the 100,000 terawatts that we could get from the sun. In the medium term, coal, oil and gas are running out, and in the long term, there's an increasing demand for energy. And food security, we're now at the limit of what can be achieved by traditional farming methods, but we could feed plenty more people because we currently throw away 40% of our food. And I challenge you to go downstairs and look at those tables. What was left on those tables? You need to take a doggy bag home every day. You do? Really? Yeah. Oh, cool. <laughs> so, now we're squeezing the Earth's resources. Seven billion people, there's a billion super consumers, that's you. There are three billion trying to catch up in Brazil, Russia, India, China, and the other countries that are following on. We currently burn through 20 million years of the sunshine that's been fossilized every year. 20 million years of the family jewels, because that's what they are, are being burned by us every year. And this, this period, this 350 year period, of using buried sunshine is an anomaly. It's a historical anomaly, and it can't continue. So, we've got seven billion people, it could be nine billion by 2050, a billion people are chronically undernourished, 180 million children are severely underweight, 400 million women uh, are anemic. All of this, nothing to do with a lack of food. We throw 40% of the world's food away, the only, thing that this, the only reason this happens is these people don't have money. They don't have economic power. If they have economic power, they'd be eating just fine. And this story, in Africa, per capita food intake is 20% less than it was in 1960. That would be a good news story in the UK. And we wouldn't have an obesity problem if our calorie intake was 20% less than it was in 1960. We'd, we'd almost be as healthy as we were under rationing during the Second World War, the period when the UK's population was at its healthiest, because it ate less. It ate less of everything, but particularly it ate less dairy and less meat. And in Africa, crop yields are one tonne per hectare. One tonne of food per hectare, that's about the same as farmers were getting 2,000 years ago in the UK. Food production in Africa has gone down it's less efficient because of water and because of the cultivars. The things they grow are not appropriate for those places. And food demand is predicted to increase by 50% by 2030 and double by 2050. Not raw calories, not, not survival food, but, but wealth food. Because the richer people are, the more protein they want to eat. And it's eating protein, particularly meat and dairy, uh, that have got us into this mess. And those of you who saw me eating will have seen me hoovering up sausage rolls, pies, bits of chicken, right? Um, it's very, very hard to convert what you know into what you do. So what do we need? Well, we need about two kilowatts of energy per person per year, as, as basically as, as electricity. And that's about twice your food intake. Right, so two count, two, and, and no, calories, joules, watts. So this is a watt to joule per second, right? The only difference between joules and calories, well, is, is a conversion factor of 44, uh, but, but essentially one's, one's what you put in the car, and the other is what you put in your mouth. Right? It's all energy. 
So if we have two kilowatts per person, yeah, the, the, the per year's there because uh, the politics graduate made this slide. Right? So it's two joules per second, continuous energy production. That's, that's keeping two kettles boiling all the time is what it needs to drive the economy for each person. And if we have GDP growth of 1.6 per annum, we'll have to up our energy supply to 28 terawatts by 2050. That's another 10 terawatts on what we have now. So we're going to have to increase our, our energy production by 50%. So we need to sustainably produce an extra 10 to 20 terawatts of electricity each year and we need to find an effective storage medium, one that exploits our current infrastructure, pipes, power lines, packets, pumps, but we also need to consider the cost of cleaning up afterwards and this energy needs to be generated at a price of about 10 cents per kilowatt. Again politics graduate did the slides, 10 cents per kilowatt hour. And at the moment, coal is our cheapest form of energy at 3.9 pence per kilowatt hour, natural gas 4 pence a kilowatt hour, a AAA battery 650 quid a kilowatt hour. Car battery 80 quid a kilowatt hour, laptop battery 2.5 quid a kilowatt hour. All the energy in these Laptop, car battery, AAA battery, all started as coal, natural gas, um, or nuclear. And transitioning from one energy form to another is not easy. It can take years. Um, it took coal 35 years to take over uh, from wood. It took oil 40 years to take over. Uh, from coal, and it's taken gas 55 years to take over from oil. And if we're going to transition to other energy sources, there's nothing to suggest that this transition time is going to get any shorter. So we have to get on with it. We need to beware of overly optimistic forecasts. Al Gore and his 100% renewable energy. Politicians dream. That's why we vote for them. Don't matter what I write here, right? Don't matter what technology you put in here, it's not going to happen quickly. <coughs> and and this transition to whatever we're going to have won't happen because of shareholders collecting dividends. Shareholder value is not going to deliver the energy transitions we need. We need policy. We need widespread policy implementation and we need it to be worldwide. It can't be country by country because if I get all my energy from coal at 3.9 pence a kilowatt hour and the pollution goes up in the air and gets blown into the next country, I don't pay for the damage it causes. And that's why we're in the mess we're in. Because we don't pay for the cleanup. And there's no perfect solution. Um, can we do it with oil, gas and coal? Um, well, we can most likely get to uh, continue making 80, 90 million barrels of oil a year. Uh, but if we, to do that, we're going to need 25% more oil and it's going to get so much more expensive because the, the cheap oil is already out of the ground. There's only the expensive oil that's in the ground. Natural gas is greener because there's less carbon dioxide produced for every kilojoule. You get more water and less CO2 when you burn it. Um, but to get to 28 terawatts, we need to be much, much better at burning it. And it's not green enough. Because it, it doesn't take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, it puts carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. So there's going to be a, a 10 terawatt shortfall. Um, 
And we don't know, we really don't know what global warming is going to do. It's an experiment that I really don't want you to have to take part in. Um, and fracking for gas, the yeah, hydraulic fracturing to release shale gas, um, it's not the answer. Uh, not only because it releases carbon dioxide, um, but, but the, the investment required to make it work is, is enormous. Coal's the worst scenario identified by the energy companies. Um, and there could be a real scramble for the remaining easily accessible coal. The environmental consequences are enormous. So, so this, this is absolutely not the answer. So then the, then the logical thing is, can we do it with, with fission, with nuclear fission? And the answer is, in principle, yes. Okay, we, we had... We've had Chern we had Three Mile Island, we had Chernobyl, we had Fukushima, right? You know, things go wrong. Let's remember, no one died. Fukushima, no one died. Bit of a mess. But no one died. It's not that unsafe. And you can deal with it. We happen to have the wrong technology because of technology lock in, but that's a different story. There are many safer ways to produce nuclear power than the light water reactors we have today. But would we want to? Um, even if I was absolutely gung-ho, um, paid for by the nuclear industry, going for it, the maths are frightening. There are currently 439 nuclear power plants in 31 countries. There are 60 under construction in 14 countries. We need 11,000 to provide 28 terawatts. There's not enough uranium-238 to do it. Consequently, you have to use plutonium. You, may, you need to use fast breeder reactors that produce more waste. So you need about 10,000 fast breeder reactors. That means building one a day for the next 50 years. So to provide all the Earth's energy from nuclear, which would, at a stroke, solve the global warming problem. We need to build a new nuclear power station every day for the next 50 years. And when we'd finished building those nuclear power stations, we'd have to start again because the ones we built first had worn out. So that commits us to building a new gigawatt nuclear power station forever. Can we do it with fusion? Well, I'm 51 years old today. And throughout my life, as long as I can remember, nuclear fusion has been 25 years away. And I imagine it will continue to be 25 years away throughout the majority of your life. There are all sorts of reasons why 30 years away, 25 years away, really doesn't matter. Right? And, the, and the reasons why aren't because we don't understand the science. We absolutely understand the science. We understand the engineering we just don't have the materials to do it. We don't have the stuff to do it. Because inside this torus that confines the plasma that reproduces the reactions that take place on the sun, there's a massive neutron load. It's bombarded by neutrons which transmute it into other elements and make it brittle. And then the fusion reactor falls apart and it's essentially nuclear waste. And they're the problems we have to overcome. The sun overcomes it by being enormous. And it doesn't need confinement because it, gravity provides its own confinement. So, can we do it with nuclear? No. What should we do with nuclear? Well, I think we should build three times as much as we are uh, because we need that base load. We need to be able to provide that electricity. And we also need to take a trillion dollar or maybe a ten trillion dollar bet on fusion just to see if we can get fusion to work. And we need to make that bet as a world, as a whole earth, in one project, a bit like the LHC, a bit like what goes on at CERN. But rather, from, rather than searching for the Higgs boson, we need to search for 
humanity's energy supply. And if we can make it work, it'll be great. Isn't the one really built in France and Georgia Tech one? So there are currently three projects going on, three fusion, fusion projects. Um, so the, the, the French one, ITER, is, um, is, a, is a confinement project. Um, there's a laser ignition project where you make a little pellet of tritium and then, and then fire a laser, a cell series of laser beams at it to, confine, to compress it. Um, and then there's a Japanese fusion project as well that uses a different kind of confinement to the French one. <coughs> None of them have ever got more energy out than was put in to get the fusion to work. <coughs> no one's had energy payback yet. So, so and, and, and actually, the projects that are taking place are pissing about. The, the, the two orders or three orders of magnitude too small. We just, you just need to, this, is, this needs to be big and have a lot invested in it. But it's going on, but it's just not big enough in my view. So can we do it with wave, wind and, and hydro? And the answer is no. There might be about eight terawatts of retrievable energy uh, from all three of these. And, um, and we'd still need nuclear. And the problem is transmission and intermittency. So um, whilst you might be able to collect energy, can you transmit it to where it's needed? And what happens when the wind doesn't blow? Turns out that Denmark could supply 80% of its electricity from offshore wind. On average, it supplies 21% of its electricity from onshore wind, offshore wind. Uh, and not last year, but the year before, uh, there were 27 days when there was no wind. And there was, there was no renewable energy. So they needed to have the base load to, to supply their energy for those hot days when people wanted to have the air conditioning on. That energy came from uh, coal fire, fired and nuclear power plants in France and Germany. Because you have to deal with, this is, this is the load um, from a typical UK house. Um, and what's happening in the middle of the night? What are these blips? Fridge. Fridge kicking in and out. Right? There's all sorts of little things going on and off all the time. The university, right? The university's base load, so kind of the, the, the grey at the bottom, um, is two megawatts. During the Christmas holidays, when everything supposedly turned off, we still burn through two megawatts of electricity. Just because everything isn't turned off. There's all sorts of things still running. So then the question is, can we do it with solar? And Carl Sagan provided us the answer to that question. Right? Because Carl Sagan said, any intelligent civilization on any planet will eventually have to use the energy of its parent star exclusively. Okay? So here I am, a professor of science, quoting a science fiction writer to you. And I'm quoting a science fiction writer to you for a reason. Carl Sagan was a deep thinker. And many, many scientists have subsequently borne this out. So, I told you right at the beginning we have a fusion reactor 93 million miles away. It's the ultimate energy security. And we can do it with photovoltaics. We can collect sunlight and make electricity. So, more than enough energy reaches us from the sun. You've all seen solar panels like this. You may even live in houses, uh, come from houses that have them on. If we had 10% efficient solar panels, i.e. 10% of the energy that landed on them was converted into electricity, this patch in Nevada would provide enough electricity to feed the whole of the US's energy economy. For the UK, it might be the area of Coventry. That normally gets a laugh. <laughs> Obviously no one from Coventry here. Right. Um, because we only need to collect one ten thousandth of the sun's energy to power our economy. But it has the same problems. If you're in Coventry, the sun doesn't always shine. The energy is difficult to collect. There's not enough insulation. And, and another quote, maybe this comes up next. 
No. Um, so Gerald Ford, I've got the I've got the tea leaf. I should put it in this presentation. Gerald Ford said, "Solar power ain't gonna happen overnight." <laughs> okay. There's the biggest intermittency problem. You only get energy from the sun when you can see the sun, and you have to have a way of storing it. So even if we could make cheaper solar cells or more or, or more efficient solar cells, it'd take us a billion dollars to fit out the UK. We'd only be able to collect if we used every household roof. We'd only collect 60% of our energy requirements. So covering the roofs isn't enough. And it cost us a billion, well, a billion dollars, a billion pounds, really doesn't matter what, you, what unit of currency you use. It's an awful lot of money. And it wouldn't do it. Because it wouldn't do it all day, 24 7. It's not going to happen. But. If you go to scale, it sort of starts to look attractive. 1% of the area of the Sahara Desert could provide us with enough solar power. The problem is, how do you get it from the Sahara to Barnsley? Because the power losses on transmission are enormous. So you could build things like this, but then you have the problem of transporting the electricity to when it's used, to where it's used, and when. Because the thing about electricity is it's only a vector. You have to generate it at the time of use. Batteries are really, really expensive, as we've already seen. And liquid <coughs> fuels are the way we need to store energy. So, Gem Solar in Spain has a whole series of mirrors that are focused on this point here, which is a big boiler uh, full of molten salt. And then the molten salt gets hot, that heat drives the turbine. Because it's molten salt, it, it cools down overnight. Uh, the boiler keeps going overnight, and it solves the intermittency problem to a certain extent. Uh, Waldpolenz Park, solar park in Germany, uh, is, is photovoltaic directly, uh, so it, it directly makes electricity from the sun, uh, as is Topaz solar farms in the US. There are many technologies to do um, solar power. And, uh, and, and our, our researchers at the University of Sheffield do a lot of work in this area. In chemistry and in physics, we have people making really, really cheap, low efficiency solar panels. Um, that are processed at room temperature and atmospheric pressure rather than being processed in the same way that you make a computer chip that has high intensity, high energy intensity. So the payback time is shorter, the energy payback time is shorter. You get the benefit quicker, but you need a larger area. We also have people who are working on high temperature, super efficiency uh, photovoltaics in physics and electrical engineering, where you collect the sunlight with large mirrors and then focus a lot of energy in a small spot and use uh, gallium arsenide as the photovoltaic material. Uh, in the previous slide, uh, you said that 1% of the Sahara's area will have enough solar power to power the entire world, but the, um, the transmission of energy will deplete that energy. Right? Yeah. So why can't you just increase the amount of area yeah, that's yeah. being used in the Sahara to overcome this problem? For instance, even if the power loss is 90% from just 1% of the Sahara, uh, consequently increasing the you know, that 1% to perhaps 90%. Wouldn't that have done this problem? It, it would, but, but then you, you, need, you need to refine all the metal you know, to make the power lines. Okay. You know, we're talking massive girders, loads of al aluminium is used as the preferred material for the power okay. transmission. Okay. You mean like the cost? The, the total cost is, you know, it just scale, it just goes, it goes up and up and up and up and up. Okay. So you have to get around the intermittency problem, you have to find a place with enough insulation in the Sahara, um, then you have to transmit the energy, you have to store it for when you use it, um, and there are problems with efficiency and with cost. So what about storage? The hydrogen economy, you've heard about the hydrogen economy. There are no natural reserves of hydrogen, you can't go dig it up. You have to make hydrogen by splitting water. So this is another vector uh, rather than a fuel. 
We can store energy as hydrogen, uh, but there's problems with containment, with infrastructure, because there aren't many hydrogen stations. Um, and essentially, you have a bomb in your car. You have a high pressure vessel containing liquefied hydrogen or highly compressed hydrogen. Um, what about? Uh, just on that point about being the bomb, like, um, my personal teacher said to me, yeah, uh, he's a civil engineer, that if someone came to him with the idea that uh, nowadays, if you got gas and like you want to cook on a naked flame, it sounds like a pretty crazy idea, but we do it, then we. Yeah, yeah, no, no, but when we have stairs as well, stairs are pretty stupid. <laughs> I, you know, I mean, we have all sorts of stupid things, but cooking on a naked flame, yeah, it's, it, it looks dangerous. Um, so, so my real objection to, to hydrogen as a, as a vector is the energy you have to invest in storing it. So either you need to make a, you need to make a metal hydride and then store the, the hydrogen in the gaps, you know, in this, in this kind of low density material. Once, once you've stored the hydrogen, the, en the, the energy density of the storage <laughs> device and the hydrogen is lower than the energy density in gasoline or methanol. And that's the fundamental objection to it. That actually, the, the, the only mechanisms for storing hydrogen require so much mass of material that the energy density, the joules stored per kilogram, are less than in a, in a liquid fuel. Just because of the density difference between the fuel and the, between a liquid fuel and, and hydrogen gas. So batteries, we hear a lot about uh, electric cars, uh, they're portable, but as you've seen they're expensive, uh, they can be inefficient, um, and there are problems with disposal, disposal. But, but there are uses, I mean, for, for personal transport, if we can afford personal transport, then it's a pretty clean way of transporting people using battery powered vehicles. Because all of the problems of generating the energy are either done at the power station, uh, or in the solar panel. And, and it's clean at the point of use. You can scale it up, you can scale batteries up, but once you go past running a, a, a single building on batteries, then, then you, lose, you lose any economy of scale. So it won't really, battery storage will work for a single house with micro generation perhaps, um, but it'll only work at that level, you can't go much bigger. There are a couple of small islands that have battery storage, but not many. So we need, we need, we need to, we're going to come back to photosynthesis. We need to use the sun to make a fuel. So, so what photosynthesis does is it takes water and splits it to make oxygen and hydrogen in what's called a light reaction. And then in the leaf there's a dark reaction that takes this hydrogen and carbon dioxide and makes organic molecules, carbohydrates, and water. So you split water in the light reaction, and then you make carbohydrate and water in the dark reaction. And then this stuff, you burn to release energy with this oxygen here. And it's a nice little loop. That's why plants do it. They get over the intermittency problem of the sun not always being there, providing them with energy, by storing <coughs> energy in the form of carbohydrate just so happens that these kind of greedy animals come along and eat them. Right. So this, this, is, this is a really nice little loop. You split water, use the, use the water to take, make carbon dioxide into an organic molecule, which is a fuel, which you can then burn with oxygen to make carbon dioxide and water again. <coughs> and you just recycle all of the atoms. And until we started digging up the family jewels of buried sunshine, that's all that happened on the Earth. Those, that, those two reactions drove everything else. So, that made people think, well, what about biofuels? Um, let's turn food crops into fuel. Right? Let's get this straight. It is immoral to drive a car on a fuel made from food. It's just wrong. 
That's why we've stopped doing it. Ten years ago, it was a big deal. It was mandated in the US that ethanol would be in the fuel supply. That mandate has now been taken away because we've realised we can't afford to take prime agricultural land to grow petrol. But you can take land that won't grow anything else and grow things like this uh, miscanthus grass, which grows very, very quickly. This is three months of growth compared to a person. And then break down the inner structure to make sugars to ferment into ethanol. Or you can do even better and use uh, algae. So this is, a, this is an, an algae with its uh, organelles that do the photosynthesis. Um, and basically they make fat, they make diesel. Um, and you can either grow them in, in great big racetrack ponds, so these ponds are, uh, have a, uh, essentially a circular track, and you can use marginal land. So you can use land that's no use for farming in ponds with slime on the top, and basically the slime contains diesel. Um, or you could use photobioreactors, so these are vertical, they have a bigger solid angle intersecting the sun, you can tilt them. Um, and we have researchers from molecular biology and biotechnology and chemical engineering who've developed a process um, for feeding <coughs> the output of a furnace into a bioreactor. Right? Because what do you need to make to make fuel? You need carbon dioxide and sunlight. So that's what's provided. You take the carbon dioxide from burning coal in a Tata steel plant in Rotherham, and then that's fed into the bioreactor, and all the vehicles that deliver the steel use biodiesel grown from the flue gas stack. And the added benefit is you can actually run the furnace more efficiently at higher temperatures because that oxidizes some nitrogen to make nitrate, and the algae need nitrate to grow as well, so you don't have to put fertilizer into the brew, it comes straight from the flue gas. But I think this is gone. Sorry, back on the algae, isn't it quite difficult to then extract the fuel? It is, you have to put energy in to get the fuel out. Uh, You either have to do ultrasonication. This is is not like kind of consumed, is it? Uh, Well, it is happening on a small scale, but all, all the kind of all the things other than coal, oil, and gas are, are, are on the kind of one or two percent scale. We, we might be able to do five percent of our energy this way, right? and, and that kind of—I that, think that's an upper limit. Um, but it might only be half a percent. But the beauty of it is, it's a liquid fuel. It's diesel. Uh, we know how to transport it. We know how to sell it. We know how to use it. I think this is the fuel of the future, though, methanol. Um, We know how to make it. Uh, You have a carbon dioxide molecule uh, and a water molecule. Um, And essentially, um, you do what's called a a gas shift reaction. So you use, um, you need hydrogen to drive the gas shift reaction. So you need to have a source of hydrogen in order to make methanol. and actually, the, the, so there's a, there's a chemist in the room here. There's a couple of them, actually. Right? Simplest way to make methanol is carbon monoxide and two hydrogen molecules. That gives you CO and 2H2. So you've got CH4OH. And essentially, that's what these reactions do. And methanol is a liquid. It works in internal combustion engines. It's easily transported. It can be converted into other fuels. Um, there's a great book by George Ola uh, called The Hydrogen Economy, and we absolutely know how to make it. A methanol is a way of converting hydrogen into a liquid, and in doing so you take a molecule of carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. And to really make this work, for every nuclear power plant we build, we should build a coal-fired power plant next to it, and you use the nuclear power to split water to make hydrogen and then use that hydrogen to convert the carbon dioxide from the coal-fired power station into methanol 
and you get to use every atom of carbon twice. Use it once in the power station to generate electricity and then you can use it again somewhere else as a fuel but it liberates that carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. Right? But because you use each carbon atom twice, you, you have a, a big reduction in the carbon intensity of the economy. But the real thing we have to do is, is make artificial leaves. Making fuel directly from sunlight in the same way that plants do. By capturing carbon dioxide, splitting water, and making methanol. Um, you can do it today. In fact, um, Colin, is it? Yeah. Yeah. So the, the last lecture in CHM 2305, uh, which is the course Connor's doing and I'm teaching, uh, will be on, uh, on the fuel cell, where, where you burn hydrogen to make electricity. Well, you can run that backwards to do electrolysis and then use the hydrogen um, to do chemical reactions. So this is a, this is a piece of, of glass that's been coated with uh, uh, titanium and platinum. Um, it sets up Essentially, it does electrolysis on a single sheet of glass, and you get bubbles of hydrogen on one side of the sheet and bubbles of oxygen on the other. And, and then you, you've used sunlight to split water, and then the split water is, is an energy source because you've got oxygen and hydrogen separated. This is going to be a game changer, it's going to change the way we live. Uh, is the use of platinum the reason it's too expensive? Correct. So unless we find some material other than platinum which does the same effect, the price will come down. Right? No, and, um, and platinum's always the go-to metal for people to do catalysis. So you get your process to work with platinum, figure out how the process works, and then go d down down the value chain in the periodic table. It's just it's just the easiest one to, to use. The, the majority of the catalysis is, will be something else. And in fact, in the leaf, uh, it's uh, magnesium in, in chlorophyll. Um, I'm always aware of the shortage of sort of, um, precious metals and things like that. Um, do you think we will have enough of whatever metals we arrive on? No. Uh, well, and again, hopefully it won't need a metal. Because okay. because if you if you if you know what if you know what's causing the catalysis, you can often do the catalysis uh, without either without a metal. Or with a bit of metal, you know, with with, with one metal atom in a in a protein complex, because that's what chlorophyll uses. It uses either copper or magnesium at the centre of a, of a porphyrin set of chains. <coughs> so I've taken a long time. I realise that I'm going to I'm going to canter through. Once we've solved the energy problem, what we need to do with food. So I've already told you that we need to collect every piece of poo. Yeah, well, we need we need to do that at the same time as doing genetic modification of plants, um, because it's a shortcut to new cultivars. Uh, we can increase yields. We can move away from monoculture. Um, essentially, now we have a set of plants, a set of rice plant, cereal plants, rice and wheat, um, that are completely disconnected from the soil. So, so we bred plants relying on, we, we bred them for one or two traits, disease resistance and seed yield, or water stress resistance and seed yield, and none of those plants are in touch with the soil anymore. Because the soil contains microbes that live symbiotically with plants. So in the grasses that are outside, the grasses trade sugar with fungi called mycorrhiza that live in the soil and they trade the sugar for trace elements. None of that happens in fields of wheat because everything that those fields of wheat need is supplied by human beings. And actually one interpretation of the way we live, you know, if, if, if someone came down from Mars, they'd say, well, there are these really, really clever plants called cereals. And they have all these stupid animals trained to feed them and spread their DNA all over so that they increase and increase and increase. 
So we need to get over this kind of hydroponic way of using soil, and we also need to get, get away from using Harbour Bosch fertiliser because it depends on, on oil. Okay? But the problem is, um, organic farming is good for feeding a billion people, two billion people. Um, but organic farming has a lot to tell us. It has a lot to tell us about how we care for the land, and a lot to tell us about how we care for the plants. And we need to do organic farming with human excrement and genetically modified plants. That's a horrible recipe, right? It, 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 doesn't, it doesn't tick anybody's boxes, but pretty sure that's what we have to do. A part of the, uh, and, and the reason we need to do GM is, um, are there any mathematicians in the room? Excellent. So, so wheat genetics are a haploid. Wheats have haploid genes. So they have, they have six sets of chromosomes. Right? We have diploid genes, two sets of chromosomes. Right? So, so let's say we want to make N changes to the genetic structure of the organism. Right? Let, where, where N's, because I want you to be able to do the calculation for me. Right? Where N's four. Okay, so how many changes do we have to make to the genes of, of the diploid, the human being? Right, two to the power of four. Yeah. yeah, which is sixteen. Sixteen, right. But to make ten changes to wheat genetics, we need to make six to the power of four changes. Right, which is six, thirty-six. About twelve or thirteen hundred. And if you need to change a hundred genes, right, in a genome in wheat, it means it's 6 to the power of 100 versus 2 to the power of 100. And we, haven't, we can't afford to wait, because to do that by conventional plant breeding will take too long. So you have to go in and change things gene by gene. And that's why the wheat genetics, we need massive computing power, and I think we need to do genetic modification. And finally, I, I, I'm a Clash fan, right? So I have, a, I have a London Calling poster in my office. Uh, not because I'm retro, it's because I was there. Right? <laughs> and um, and so, so I'm calling this a punk fertiliser, right? Potassium, um, so phosphorus, nitrous, potassium fertiliser. In the 18th century, we learned how to use punk fertiliser. No turd was wasted. Um, in the 19th century, we, connect, we collected pump fertilizer everywhere, um, whether it was fossilized or whether it was fresh. Um, <clears throat> now, there are 20 times more people producing fertilizer. <coughs> we, could, we could turn off 60% of the Harbour Bosch process if we collected every poo. We don't have the infrastructure to do it. Because we have the infrastructure of sewers and the excrements contaminated with all sorts of other things. But in big developing cities that still have cesspits, now you used to have to pay to have them emptied. Now in New Delhi and in Bangalore, the cesspit owners get paid for the contents of the cesspit because it has an economic value as fertiliser and you can improve yields enormously so we need to take out our Victorian sewage system and put in long drop dry toilets in our houses and reinvent cesspits so we can use we can recycle every atom to fertilise the land Uh, I want to finish with this. Um, I, I, I've started really, really hard uh, to try and change the way I live and drink black tea. And the reason for that is um, we, we set this as a homework problem um, to the to first year undergraduate physicists. Are there any physici physics students here? Okay, do you remember doing the energy course with Richard Jones? 
Professor Richard Jones. Curly haired guy. <laughs> kind of tall. Head to it to one side. <laughs> really clever. Okay. Maybe it's a second year course. Then. <laughs> you did it, did you? Do you remember doing this calculation? No, yeah. Right, so what's the energy content of a cup of tea, milk, and one sugar? So I'm a chemistry professor. I guessed that 80% of the energy content of a cup of tea was boiling the water. Putting the energy in to boil the water. Right? And for black tea with no sugar, I was absolutely right. If you have sugar and milk, then 44% of the energy is heating the water. 20% of the energy is growing, refining, collecting, and distributing the tea and the sugar. And 36% of the energy in a cup of tea is that splash of milk. Because milk is really, really energy intensive to produce. So if you want to be good to the environment, become a vegan and make your last meat meal your pet. Because <laughs> running a cow or a dog is like running a car. So a, lab a Labrador has the same carbon footprint as, uh, as an SUV doing 15,000 miles a year. A cat has the same carbon footprint as a Skoda Fabia. Right? It's a real luxury. And why? why? Why is dairy so wrong for us now? And the answer is because there are 7 billion of us. Dairy was something that came out of the Neolithic period and farming. There was no money. The only thing that was important for your survival was food. And the way to make friends was through exchanging food. And the most energy dense food there is, is butter. Because butter has the same calorific value, the same number of joules per kilogram as coal. And it made sense when there were a million people. It makes no sense now. And the biggest challenge of all? Complacency. You've heard everything I've had to say. I've told you about the little ways I've changed my life. And I've admitted to you the ways I haven't been able to change my life. But we are going to have to change the way we live. And I'm really, really confident that we'll solve all these problems. Why? Because you chose to come here and do this. Because you are the generation that has to fix this problem. Because my generation and my parents' generation fucked it up. Right? And, you, and we, collectively, have to learn how to feed all these people having lived through the anomaly using only sunshine. Done.